So we got Karsten uh, next to me, uh, Margaret from HP, and uh, Benny. So we're going to get started about platform as a service. The, the whole concept about platform as a service has been moving and you know, obviously threatening to change the whole ecosystem, but I see a lot of adoption challenges. And like most technology, I see startups use the technology and then it goes on to enterprises. But what I'm seeing with platform as a service recently with some uh, recent quotes that the visibility is not there and you know, focus on several areas like um, security, performance, uh, we need some more trust. It's very different from you know, business process and software as a service. So I believe that platform as a service members, uh, vendors uh, need to make sure that there is the trust, uh, especially for startups, that will then eventually go to enterprises adopting it. I think um, Intel gave a good example of you know, what they are doing, but how do you expand on that? Um, so, so I had a few questions uh, you know, set up uh, you know, for, for our audience, so let me get, it, get up there. Um, and now I get to. So one of the one of the questions, you know, overall I want to find out is is the platform as a service visibility hurting enterprise adoption? That's what I want to find out. And if you feel that it's also hurting, you know, startup adoption, that may be something that we can talk through. Um, so users are always interested in monitoring usage. So when we have these platform as a service uh, vendors, how do you monitor what's underneath the covers? Um, you know, they, they, there is complexity underneath it. People want to abstract it. So, so what are your thoughts on, you know, the kinds of resource allocation and resource visibility utilization that you want to provide to the platform as a service user? Mm -hmm. so, well, one of the things that, that we've seen from our customers is that there's, there's a wide variety of customers. And typically their needs for a pass are, are they're not the same from one customer to the other. And they're not the same for a given customer in time. So typically, um, you know, you'll see a customer start with PaaS, and they want a lot of abstraction. They want a lot of automation. They want to basically be able to get started very quickly. Perhaps it's in the, it's in the early stages of their product life cycle, and they just want to get going. And so visibility and, uh, and you know, knowing exactly what's going on under the hood is maybe not as important at that stage. But typically, time after time, if the, if the app is successful, it's going to grow. Right. And at that point, it gets more complex. You start wanting to take a look at what's happening under the covers. You want to understand more and have more visibility. And so I think it's very important that while, as, as PaaS providers, we give that abstraction, that automation, that, that quick initial experience, we provide visibility throughout the stages of the life cycle so that when someone gets to the point where they want control, they want to go under the hood, they want to uh, adjust things and understand exactly what's going on, that the visibility is there. And, uh, and that's, I think, managing that balance throughout the life cycle is real important. And, uh, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, there are trade-offs in the different types of technologies that you use and how you architect your paths that can either give you more visibility or not. And things, things as simple as having visibility to what, what type of VM, what type of instance is mm -hmm. running underneath. Uh, is, is key for, for being able to deliver that visibility. And you don't have to actually even sacrifice that at, at the early stages of the life cycle. That, that visibility can be there throughout. Okay. Margaret, do you have... No, I, I think that's a good point. But you and I also talked earlier. I don't think visibility or transparency is a PaaS alone issue. I mean, that's been something that yeah. has been a cloud issue from the beginning, whether it's for a startup or for an enterprise. And I think where that comes into play, especially in what I always talk to IT leaders about, is to make sure you understand the layers. And Dave brought this up when he was talking about, you know, do you understand, if, is there an infrastructure as a service player that's different from your platform as a service player? And, and then you want to understand what is the visibility of that you know, throughout these layers that we're now seeing where you may be using, you know, a SaaS application that was built on a PaaS that uses somebody else's IaaS. And so then how do you look at security policy guidance? Is, is there compliance that is consistent? Are they all PCI compliant or do you even know? Um, so there's kind of that layer where it's not just the PaaS that you need to be concerned about. But I think that we've also seen some momentum around more of the open has frameworks or infrastructure as a service frameworks, whether it be OpenStack or some of the others, because of that desire to have transparency. Um, you know, you don't want to just have this black box where you can't say, well, 
you know, what, what does that infrastructure look mm -hmm. like or what are your, your policies around that? So I think we're going to continue to see that. And we've heard this morning from several of the speakers that we're driving towards more openness, more transparency. And that's across cloud computing uh, infrastructure in general, not just a platform as a service. Okay. Good. Yeah, I agree. So the issue is uh, not really uh, visibility only. It's also about controllability. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to be able to control things that are relevant to your application. Uh, the path is built on the assumption that one size fits all. And I agree that this is good for initial steps of mm -hmm. development, prototyping. But when you need to scale, each application has its own requirements, security, uh, scalability, cost, availability, and so forth. So you need to provide this level of uh, visibility and the controllability into the PaaS environment so customer can understand what is going on, why things are not working, and what ca they can do in order to improve. Mm -hmm. The other thing, when I looked at your initial definition of uh, visibility, mm -hmm. there are two levels of visibility. I think one is related to the type of things that are more technical related to my specific application, and the other one is to my own operation. So what I mean by that, providing as much information to increase fidelity and the trust in the PaaS provider. In general, it's good for any uh, service provider. Mm -hmm. uh, Amazon, for example, is doing an extremely good job in providing information on their availability, on their outages. Uh, mm -hmm. You can try, you can start saying problem even before they are reflected in your application. And you know when problem arise, uh, you, you may know before they are actually reflected in your application, and it gained trust and the uh, confidence in what you're doing. So in general, I think uh, increasing or expanding the vision of visibility into your own operation. Mm -hmm. I have to admit that for somebody like Amazon, it's kind of easy because they are using the same terminology that mm -hmm. the application guys are using or the users of their service are using. Here it's a little bit more difficult, but as much information as you're providing, because openness is not only about open source or about mm -hmm. open standard. It's also openness about what are my own problems, where am I facing uh, problems? And the other thing, it's about controllability as well. So, so I, I think we just talked about startups you know, versus enterprises. Do you see that startups are more the ones who can understand deeply what is behind and where they see the performance issues versus enterprises. No, I think it's more about time to market. It, it's yeah. just that they, is it just they, based on the time? Wins? I think there's, there's yeah. cost involving. It's time to market. It's the fact that we've got to get this out there and try it. They're willing to try new things. You know, They don't have the uh, ability to, to spend a lot of money. They don't have a lot of developers. Mm -hmm. And typically, they pick a path that happens to fit the knowledge base or the languages that the founders know how to use. So, I mean, it, I don't think it ends up being a huge, um, you know, decision criteria path or some massive grid. At I the think beginning, it's, okay. Yeah, I mean, all the startups I talk to, it's like, oh, we're a .NET shop, we're gonna look at Azure, you know, or whatever it is. Or, you know, we've got a Microsoft connection, or we've got an Amazon connection, and it becomes a very basic thing. And then, you know, maybe two years later, when they are starting to get customers, they start looking at, oh gosh, can we, you know, can we move this to a different okay. platform? Can we start to expand it? What are we doing around redundancy? What about availability zones? Blah, blah, blah. Then it starts to become so a So it becomes more important. critical when they grow up and they reach mm -hmm. reach a sure. certain point of time and they're scaling and that's And then hopefully they pick something like where they can move it a little bit yeah, and, right. and change the, the maturation. But. So, so going back to controllability, which you talked about, and I, a lot of folks want to choose where they deploy after they write something. They say, hey, this is the better, mm -hmm. all the way down to the CPU level, that this CPU may be better for this, you know, for video, uh, you know, uh, encryption or whatever they're trying to do. Uh, do you see that kind of controllability being able to be provided to the past users eventually? Uh, is anybody doing it now? Or oh, definitely, or I mean, that's that's uh, that's that's something we see with with our customers quite regularly, where they they have an interest, and again, it's it's where they are in the life cycle. It's uh -huh. uh, the the degree of control. There's a lot of customization that happens again. Mm -hmm. Every app is different, right? And so, and it's really a combination of many different systems, many other apps, especially when, when you consider uh, all the other services that can be brought into an app mm -hmm. that tie into other apps. It can get very, very complex. And you may end up with one particular situation where, okay, I have this dependency where I can't run that version. I have to run a version that's, right. uh, that's a little bit uh, older. And if, if a PaaS can't provide the ability to do that level of customization, 
then that customer is really stuck and, and, and they have to kind of scratch their heads and think, okay, well, what, what, what else can I do? So that's the kind of thing that uh, I, th I think we see pretty regularly. Yeah, I, I think also I hear and see a lot around uh, consistent policy controls, access controls, you know, how the data is being shared across those applications. I thought Dave's simplistic diagram that still showed the complexity is very real. You know, and you end up seeing that across different paths, whether they be private or public. So they've got these different cloud environments. Mm -hmm. You've got integration issues. And then you've kind of got that, how do I create these consistent policies so that, you know, if I've got all these developers building different kinds of web apps, do I have some kind of consistent access control where, okay, to access this data, you need to do X, Y, Z. And so I think, I didn't hear a lot about that this morning, but that whole kind of policy level and, and access control there is really critical. Beyond a encryption of you know the data, it's more you know how are you uh -huh. controlling the access to the data across all these different applications and different platforms. Yeah, absolutely. We are saying the same thing. So we were talking till now mainly about uh, uh, startups that have the luxury to start from scratch and develop their own uh, application with no limitation. Basically, the buying into the Paz vendor uh, uh -huh. religion and start building the application around this type of uh, solution. When you're starting to talk about uh, enterprises and even about uh, startups uh -huh. that are more mature in terms of their uh, usage of IT and billing application, then you are running into problem. I have already an existing uh, code that I have developed. It doesn't really fit exactly the PaaS. Uh -huh. And here you're running into a problem because the PaaS was supposed to provide you all the isolation, uh -huh. all the abstraction, and save you from the overhead of dealing with those components. And now you're starting to run, okay, so am I really a pass provider that I'm playing it completely uh, clean and I'm not intervening or I'm not trying to educate my customer about my problems, about my criteria of running on existing infrastructure? Or do I let the customer do it? I think that's a really good point. We've talked a lot. I mean, Greenfield Apps is, is an easy yes. story. Yeah. It's that application migration, application transformation, where it becomes more complex. Yes. Right. Um, and I think that's an area where we'll see a lot of maturity happening in the next you know, 12, 24 months among the past providers. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of collaboration going on, I think, at those different layers to enable that. Because the enterprises definitely want to do that. They want to move from those legacy apps. They want to have more agility around that. But it's really... It's ugly right now, for the most part, with a lot of them. And I think that's a that's a, a key place where the the service in PaaS really comes into play. Because again, yeah, with these complex environments, it's one thing to start off from greenfield, but with enterprises, uh, there's there's lots of a lot more restrictions that they have in terms of okay, if we want to look at the cloud and how to how to use that, they start already with a list of requirements that's quite long and getting they've through customized that. those apps so much, right? Uh, oh I mean, yeah, customized like over years, and they're they're, they're strange things that are uh, you know if you look at it, and you step back and you're like, why are you doing that? Well, there's a story behind that, right? right? And so getting through those hurdles and getting to take advantage of what PaaS and the cloud can offer. Um, requires requires help in a lot of a lot of cases, and so leveraging best practices, leveraging expertise, is is a key thing that I think uh, PaaS providers need to do to help those companies. Yeah, it's kind of get. ironic. There's a huge growth in professional services around oh, yeah. past sure. use of application sure. migration. Sure. I know, I yeah. mean, we're getting yeah. a lot of revenue around that. So, yeah. I mean, it's kind of ironic when you think about PaaS, you think self-service, self-provisioning, self-management, lifecycle management's already right. in there, all this kind of stuff. But if you're actually looking at doing that application migration or some massive transformation project, chances are you're going to have to bring in some professional services and, and to make it happen. So I think it's a good idea to do both. I mean, have your new projects where you can get your developers using, you know, a really uh, easy web-based environment to build new apps, but you're, you're going to have to have this project behind the scenes happening. As well. Yeah, so I, I want to make a comment about uh, cloud migration or there is even a section right now called uh, migration brokerage or migration <laughs> brokering, which is always associated, like you were saying, with a lot of expensive uh, professional services. services. I don't think this is the right way. I think that the migration into whatever mode, the hybrid mode, public cloud, is an ongoing process, and it's not a singular one-time event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit in both places, and you have to build a solution as an enterprise that allows you to be in both places, especially if you have some uh, other type of code that uh, you're dealing with. I think we all have seen it 
uh, you can see by my white hair that people are still stuck with mainframes. So migration didn't really happen, and it's not really completed, even for those type of things. So when we talk about paths, we have to look at it both as vendors providing the tools and as users, as a process, not as a singular one-time event. But if you talk I was just, about who, who's doing, though, someone's yeah. doing mainframe platform. I just read some article really? about somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the future, they were like helping you, <laughs> helping you move mainframe apps to the cloud. Yeah, but if you talk yeah, about migration, how are you, you know, I understand, you know, offering migration, but how are you really addressing the needs for developers, though, over there when you, you know, right. what, what, what is a developer getting out of a platform as a service? And, you know, we can talk about what they can do then with this visibility underneath it. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask two things. One, one is you're, you're migrating, you do something, and then you also need some education because the whole mindset has to change from what they did yeah. in the past to right. what they're doing now with, with, a, with a technology like platform as a service. So I want both those questions if you could. I mean, there's some things that, that you can do with a pass that build in best practices that mm -hmm. help guide someone as they come in mm -hmm. to understanding, okay, well, here, here are blueprints that can give you a good idea yeah. uh, of where to start, right? And so that, I think, is an important part about uh, offering a pass service is that the product itself can guide you mm -hmm. uh, towards best practices. And if you, if, you know, with control, of course, and flexibility and having all these options comes the possibility to go down bad paths, right? And uh, with, with a product that uh, identifies those situations and at least lets someone know, okay, well, you're about to use a version that uh, you know, is, is, is not really recommended. You really need to know what you're doing. Those kinds of things, I think, can help uh, kind of institute those best practices into the product. But at the same time, there always has to be someone that you can, that you can reach out to uh, that can uh, that can support you. I think support for a pass is extremely important, okay. and uh, that's a, that's a key thing. I, I think also offer. just uh, to kind of plug the public pass a bit is that community around it. So I think mm -hmm. when passes become powerful is when you get kind of that application marketplace mm -hmm. phenomenon where you've got people that have built all these apps on that pass. There's a sharing capability, a marketplace capability, and that shared learning. Um, you know, and, and yes, you could get that in a private path if you have a huge enterprise IT organization where people are sharing that, so it's kind of an internal version of that. Um, and I love the Intel idea where, you know, you kind of had this, you know, code -a and you kind of start to build that community yeah. within your own um, environment. But I, I think that for companies that don't have that ability or that level of scale, that's where a public path really adds value because oh, yeah. you, can, you can start to share those yeah. learnings or even share applications, right? I mean, there's a lot of... Um, you know, where it's like, oh, somebody already built an app that did that. You know, I just need a scheduling app. Uh -huh. You know, oh, look, somebody already built that on, on that PaaS, and you can start, you know, borrowing from others. Yeah. Yeah, going back to the point of uh, looking at it as a process, I think it's very important that the environment in the uh, two sides uh -huh. will be, or in multiple sites, depending on where you want to run it, will be identical. So you want to provide an environment which is both uh, here in the private and in the public on different public cloud, looks the same, and at yeah. least the developers don't have to bother with the differences between them. Uh, this is the way, by the way, in Rovello, we are looking at the problem, trying to provide uh, environments that are the same. It's easier to start even for uh, enterprises from the trivial use cases, which are non-production. So test and development, staging, demoing, and so forth. Get this feeling, get the confidence. This is a good technology, stable, and then move into production. Okay. There was a question, Larry, yep. right wanted... in the middle. Yeah. Both. So as a marketplace, yeah, <laughs> I'm being too easy on these guys. Here. I think Is it's both. It I mean, for me. <laughs> yeah. So, so what you're saying is, where is the marketplace, and how is that marketplace going to come, and how are the pass vendors going to start supporting and helping a marketplace? Yes.
Yes, right. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think the pass vendors need to come in more to promote the uh, the app, the apps, and uh, you know, sharing of. So apps I can so. answer this from. I, I don't want to do market speak though, but we're not supposed to yeah, promote we're not. what we're doing. The, <laughs> right. the vision from an HP perspective with our APAS is more plugging into the OpenStack ecosystem, so that you are actually able to share some applications that have been built on the on the OpenStack environment. What does it mean to build an application? Sorry. Yeah. So. So it's more at the at the foundational level. So it's not that your application necessarily is going to be built on OpenStack, but you can build it on using whatever language you want, whether it's Ruby or PHP or Java or or whatever. But the point is, is that you have a literally a marketplace where anyone that's built an application using a PaaS that uses OpenStack, you can then share that application or buy that application so that there's a single place to go is what I was talking about. I, and it's not, I wasn't picturing anything different than even how you do a force.com application on the top of Salesforce where you're looking for an application yeah. that's gonna add to it. It's only more of a PaaS environment as opposed to a SaaS environment. I mean, yeah. you certainly shouldn't have to have your application. Oh, yes. Yeah. We have our own APIs, we have our own services, we have our own unique business model. Right. We can't buy those packages off the shelf. Let me, let me, I guess when I, <laughs> I, I don't want to make it look like it's some package you're going to download and start running. It's going to be like right. a skeleton of an app which right. takes you 80% there right. or 60% yeah. there. You're not going to go and, and just go and install it like, you know. Yeah. So, okay, if it's GitHub, it's GitHub is a location that we can put that there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge area where certainly our, our, a lot of our customers take advantage of what's out there in, in the open source right. community. Um, GitHub is a great place for that. Mm -hmm. There's also more packaged uh, components that you can add to an application, which right. ultimately should have, have nothing to do with the PaaS in terms of being able to run. The PaaS should be able to bring that to you, make it right. easy as a developer to integrate these other components uh, if they are packaged components through add-on programs or marketplaces. But those add-ons shouldn't have any dependency on what, you know, which paths they get run on. So yeah, let me just uh, think, I, I'd like to hold off some of the questions if you do, Dave. Uh, we'll, we'll take it back on. I do want to cover a couple of other topics. So one of the things I feel as we spoke about multiple paths, how do you compare them? You know, are there some standards coming up that, you know, uh, as a user, you say, hey, I've got all these options, all these vendors, and I want to, this is my problem. I want to compare. I want to measure this pass versus this pass, and you know, that's where visibility helps. And I want to get your opinion on what you're doing to help users compare multiple pass solutions. I mean, there, there are so many, uh, so many different variables that you can use to compare. I think customers have to start by looking at what is, what's their criteria, what are they, okay. what's important to them. Uh, is it about speed? Do they recognize that they have a life cycle that they have to be supported throughout? Uh, I think it's, it's important to step back and look at not just the short term of, okay, I need to get my app up running really quickly and just, just do the first thing that comes along, but think about, okay, what happens when it's going to be successful? What are the types of things that I'm going to need uh, when I get to a larger scale? Okay. And you know, going through that thought process, I think it makes it a lot easier to compare the different offerings. Any, any thoughts on the? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, if somebody in an enterprise has to evaluate the different pass option, he has to look at it like a multi-dimensional matrix of performance, cost, and some uh, restriction or constraint, like high availability, security, and try to compare the different points on the multi-dimensional graph from different pass provider or different uh, service providers. So this is one way to look at it. Uh, it's a elaborate process, and I think that uh, having standard benchmarks that people can agree on uh, will help a lot because it, it will normalize the result across the industry. Another aspect which I think is related to the question that we're asked here is that one has to look also at the ecosystem around the specific path that's being uh, provided. No path provider mm -hmm. can provide all the needs of an enterprise. There need to be an ecosystem. So how wide is this ecosystem? How profitable is it? How incentivized they are to build new uh, products and support and do all the other things that enterprises that have other challenges or special needs can use the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So, and the only thing I would add is core competency. You know, when you look at that criteria, there's also yeah. just what are you capable of. See, see, standards for infrastructure as a service is very simple in a way to you know measure and compare. But when you go to platform as a service, you come up with the next one, which is, goes on to my next question, which is security is still a big issue, especially for enterprises, especially for certain applications. They vary in measures. So, what are the types of security, you know, visibility that you can provide to feel that hey, I feel good this platform as a service is going to support my application needs, my business needs, that, that we are going to need to do that. So yeah. I would like to get I mean, your opinion specifically on past visibility to security. Right. I mean, it really comes down to visibility. And, and for a lot of the security requirements that enterprises have, they have to have ultimate visibility to everything that happens with their app, who makes any changes. I mean, a lot of what a PaaS does is provide services and abstraction. But again, you don't have to trade off visibility in doing that. Um, and so much of, of what's required for security is simply knowing who did what when. Okay. And so long as you have that covered, then you're able to uh, you know, give those kinds of assurances to customers that, yes, at any given time, you can go see exactly what's happening in your app. If you can't do that, then that's, then that's, a, that's a challenge. And I think right? that's where we've seen a lot of growth with the PASs, too, is in the monitoring, auditing, reporting, but also on compliance. So I mean, I think that you know, and you've got folks like the Cloud Security Alliance and other organizations that are just driving, you know, PCI compliance is just a baseline or SOC 2 or, you know, whatever it is. So there's kind of a compliance mandate level that if they don't, ha that's the checkbox. So, right. um, you know, I think that, again, maybe more at the enterprise level, but we're, we're seeing more and more just, you know, baseline compliance mm -hmm. across all of those different areas. And then I think the whole thing of being able to track who's had access to what parts of the application and when, who's made changes. So you're also auditing kind of you know, updates to that and, and the redundancy around that. So I, I think there's a lot of maturity that has been happening and will continue to happen around that, especially in the auditing area. Yeah, I see actually the security is one of the opportunities for PaaS provider because yeah. meeting uh, or being compliant with a certain uh, uh, standard or with certain, is a value by itself yeah. to the end customer. So if you can say, look, yeah. I took care of this, uh, for many uh, enterprises it will be great. It's yeah. uh, like you were saying, it's a check mark, but it's also uh, as uh, I would say intellectual property value mm -hmm. by knowing how to deal with this and also instructing naive users that wants to develop on the paths, what are the things that they can do or not do. So it is a burden, it's additional task, additional work yeah. that the pass provider have to do, but it is also an opportunity which I believe that customer will pay dearly to mm -hmm. get this type of... It's kind uh, of like a premium SLA almost yeah. right. I mean, when it comes to security. I think we're seeing a lot of enterprises willing to pay more for more right. premium levels of service, whether that be reliability, Absolutely. uptime, or security, or you know, whatever. Right. Especially right. when it was officially certified. Right. So you get right. a certification right. from a third party, and uh, it was certified. I think, I mean, ultimately that it comes down to what a PaaS is really there to do, which is to remove complexity, make things easier to do, save you time. And right. security is a great opportunity for that. Absolutely. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. So uh, other than that, one of the things uh, for infrastructure as a service, it's easier to adopt. There are, there are less, lesser of a lock-in in my perception. But when you go to a platform and you reach higher, you've got bigger lock-in issues. So. I want to find out from your, you know, what are your thoughts on making users feel I'm not locked into this platform as a service? You know, can I move from one vendor yeah. to another if they don't provide me the I mean, visibility? That's the whole open APIs, portability, a, yeah. how they can move. And it all goes back to the data. Can I, be, I mean, more than yeah. I think the application, it's where, does, where is my data sitting? How much does the application depend on it? Is there a shared data resource? And, and also, I, I think what, what Benny brought up that's really important is kind of that bursting capability, which people are wanting more and more. It's like, you know, how you can kind of share between those private and, and public environments. Yeah, and, and in a lot of cases, when you look at, um, if you look at what a PaaS provider really needs to be able to do is to be able to provide options so that customers can move. If there are, again, in that life cycle, if their needs change and they need to be able to run on a different uh, infrastructure as a service, uh, that they have an ability to do that. Okay. And you can also look at, at, at PaaS in terms of where, where does the application run? Is it really running on top of the PaaS, or is the PaaS setting that up on an infrastructure as a service mm -hmm. to run somewhat independently of the PaaS? And uh, you know, there, there are differences in the market out there. I think that's an important way to look at things from the standpoint of how easy is it if I'm running technically on a layer mm -hmm. that is, uh, is abstracting the infrastructure versus Am I actually 
having my past set myself up on an infrastructure as service to make it much easier to, uh, to port from one to another. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, any of the other? Right, so it reminds me a lot of my old days at uh, Reddit, looking at it from an operating system okay. perspective. You need to have a set of uh, uh, certifications. So this is an automatic way. Think about the problem of an operating system vendor. He has to certify the operating mm -hmm. system on many uh, hardware pieces running beneath the operating system, and then for the ISVs. Uh, to make sure that any uh, application will run regardless of the changes or regardless of the hardware. So it's a two-way uh, certification, one above and one beneath. So using this analogy, a pass provider need to provide kind of certification and the, uh, you know, support packages to run on many clouds okay. from beneath and provide the same thing from application provider so they know that once they run it on they run the test, it will run on any uh, pass vendor that is claiming that is supporting this type of pass. Uh, I like the way, you, I actually like that stack, the way you both, so it's not just portability of the, you know, the information right. or the application itself, but actually, you know, that application on different infrastructures below. Yeah. And so that's a good way to look at yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. So it will also involve some work that will have to be done by the uh, cloud provider themselves. If I'm using, going back to my analogy with the operating system, in many cases, it's the hardware, the OEM vendors, uh -huh. which are doing the certification itself. Uh -huh. So this is for the pass provider uh, responsibility, but there is also tremendous responsibility on the uh, pass users, the developer. They have to make sure that they are uh, very disciplined. They have to refrain from using non-standard APIs, uh -huh. whether they are in the specific pass or they are in the services that some cloud provider are providing. We see the tendency more and more that cloud provider, in order to differentiate between themselves sure. and in order to uh, keep, uh, you know, to stop the race to the bottom, adding right. all kind of services. Right. These type of services are really lock, locking in the developer into uh, those things. So the developer has to be very disciplined uh, in terms of the services that he is using if he doesn't want to lock himself in. Mm -hmm. uh, in startup it's very difficult to manage it because they will always say, all I care is about getting it up and running, don't confuse me right. with the scalability. But more mature right. companies, even startups and enterprises understand this very well. So, I mean, I'm going to close out and I know we have a few questions that some folks had put up in their hands so they can ask after this one. So what, are there any additional ways that you can improve you know, visibility to pass that will improve the adoption, that it improves the trust from users, that makes it easier for them? You know, to, to adopt PASS and start saying, hey, this is where we are going to go for in the future. This is the, the way we are going to take it forward. So I want to use that as a closing question and then yeah. So I think the way to do it is to have some kind of an hybrid between infrastructure as a service okay. and platform as a service that combine the advantages of the two together. Kind of bring your own PASS. So every enterprise has their own version or their own colors of an existing PaaS, or they are building a few things together. So use the more primitive building blocks to build your own PaaS. Use those as a standard component in the infrastructure level. So this is opposed to building one VM with all the uh, nine yards of all the possible component. Just build it right for what you need, and then use the regular PaaS to manage it. I don't want to promote ourselves too much, but that's exactly what we are doing in Ravello. So I invite you guys to go and look at what we have done in order to do these things. I mean, I think it's a, it's, there's a combination of things. Uh, I mean, visibility, again, throughout the life cycle is, is key. And, uh, and I mean, to build on what, what you said, I think for a lot of enterprises when they're looking at this, they, they've got these legacy systems, they're going to have to have some type of hybrid. Uh, to, to make their applications work. And, you know, over time, obviously they, have full, they should have full visibility into what they have in-house. They should expect the same of their PaaS vendors. And I think, uh, to, to one of the points that, that, that Benny made earlier, visibility goes beyond just what's happening with the application. Mm -hmm. It's what's happening uh, to all the components. So when, there is a, when there's a security vulnerability that's announced in the market for some particular component, the pass vendor proactively provides that information to their customers, uh, even proactively uh, can resolve those types of issues. That kind of 
very high speed visibility to what's going on with all those components that make up an app uh, is, is a key part, I think, of the service that a PaaS provider can provide. So, Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Intel's maturity model, I love that, that cloud mm -hmm. maturation model. Um, because I think what that showed is exactly you know, what we're talking about, is the fact that most enterprises are going to move to a hybrid world. You've got to have that natural um, ability or you know, open APIs beyond, you know, between these different environments, but also the ability to move between them easily or burst from one to the other. And then importantly, what we don't have yet that I think you know, we will start to see is that kind of common management and monitoring layer. Mm. Um, and that's where you know, if there's vendors that, that live across the entire hybrid world, they can start to bring that added value of saying, okay, here's your single view, your single pane um, into all of your different levels. And, and I think that for enterprises, that's gonna become um, really the um, bottleneck to not truly ad adopting kind of this hybrid environment if they can't have a single view, a single management, yeah. a single ability to monitor and audit mm -hmm. and control. Um, I, I guess that, and that's that, where we've got to mature as an industry yeah. still. Yeah, I agree. And that. that's where most standards are required to have you have a common API mm -hmm. call that yeah. you can go and view everybody with one, mm -hmm. one dashboard if you would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to open it up for questions, Dave. Sorry about that, but we. <laughs> 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 Yeah, or as for a microphone, so yeah, Dave's loud enough, we can hear Yeah, him. we can hear Dave. <laughs> Go for it, Dave. Well, I just wanted to challenge a couple of things. Uh, specifically, it's like the idea that platform as a service, as we seem to be talking about in this conference, is really the way it will necessarily evolve. And particularly, the like what I like to uh, highlight is that uh, one of our um, many, many, many time participants in our cloud camps, Bitnami, uh, their platform is not really a pass, it's more of like an app store. You literally take right. the most popular applications on the planet and they automatically deploy them into infrastructure as a service. Right. They have grown, just to give you a little statistic, they have grown from 100,000 downloads last year to 1 million downloads this year. How are you guys doing? Okay. Good. I think he's bringing up a different yeah, point yeah. though that I actually did want to bring. That I think we need a new name for PaaS because platform as a service. I mean, the, just it's the term platform general. has become right. you know to cover a whole lot of different right. types of solutions. And really, what we're talking about is an app dev yeah. as a service. I guess. I mean, because like with that, that I, I agree. I mean, the terminology is very broad, and we've seen lots of companies come in and say, "Well, we are a PaaS." And right. I mean, you can even take that. The, that description and look at things like, and you could say GoDaddy is a, is a, is a PaaS. Right. It allows people to come yeah. and they have, you know, it is. It's a I'm platform sure to, huge right. volumes of, right. uh, of users setting up their websites uh, <laughs> in that way. I want to just follow it up by saying that uh, uh, the, one of the comments last night was that enterprise is funding all of this, which I think is a very good point. However, the innovation is really not coming from the enterprise. In fact, the economy is like a, uh, a non-funded number. They got their funding recently from like white companies. So we're seeing a lot of the innovation coming out still. And while I'm, of course, anybody knows, we know the huge uh, past, I just think that it's still yet to be determined exactly how this plays out. It's one of those, one of those apps that's getting downloaded 100,000 times could evolve into something, and you, know, you might see some new model. Yeah, but Dave, so she lists her apps on her download page and her popularity. But I think this goes back to the ecosystem discussion is that I think what's interesting, no matter what part you're looking at, is where the ecosystem builds the innovation, builds the maturity, and it always moves up the stack and it always moves up the company size. And, and I think, I mean, that's what's interesting and exciting but I, to me. I, I think that you know, the whole thing about crowdsourcing is important when you talk about pass and when you talk about enabling the, you know, the people working out of their garage to sit down and build something which is game changing and grows around those paths. So 
Right. That's, that's the thing. So if there is yeah, any, any thoughts add, on that? I, I fully agree. The, the jury is still out. What is the right way of doing it? And the, you will see the skepticism because customers don't care how you call what they are doing. They want to get their uh, right. job done. Whether you call it uh, PAS, yeah, SAS, whatever it is, they will look at you and say, ah, this is how you call it. I've been doing it for the last 10 years. Apparently, it's called SAS. So <laughs> customers really want to get things done, and they don't care how it's being how it's being implemented. But what you see, the issue is things that we discussed initially. How much control and how much visibility they have into a PAS which is rigid and has no access to the layer that's running uh, on beneath it. After all, a PAS is really over the top service. So a clean PAS, you're running on a cloud provider type of uh, service. It's like the other over the top that we have seen in other industries. So if this is good enough for you, and you're running on top of this stack, then you're probably uh, well with doing a pass as is. But if you're like most users, you want some more control in the infrastructure, then you need the type of uh, in-between solution between the infrastructure and the pass itself to have more, more control on the infrastructure component and be able to manage from the pass side as well. I think one other thing to add is that there are there are PaaS solutions out there that uh, have free tiers that draw you know a lot of numbers right and they can get a lot of people deploying very small apps mm -hmm. and that's that's good that raises visibility overall for PaaS as as an option but ultimately I think when customers are looking at at different PaaSes they need to look beyond just the the total number of uh, of apps deployed to well what are the size of those apps and how many large-scale apps are really being handled by that PaaS, which is, uh, which is certainly where a lot of the value of PaaS, I think, comes into play. So, Okay, I think we are running out of time here, and right there we have uh, lunch waiting for us after this, so I'll let James take it over. Thank you for our panelists and good discussions from our audience, too.